This is a Main Hustle Media Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Jackie O and you're listening to Militantly Mixed. Yo, this is Rashani from the Single Simulcast. And when I'm not making you laugh or making up parody songs, I'm kicking back listening to Militantly Mixed. I would like to acknowledge that the Militantly Mixed podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Chumash and the Tongva people, and I wish to pay my respects to the people of those nations, both past and present. Hey y'all, welcome to Militantly Mixed, the podcast about race and identity from the mixed race perspective. I am your host, Charmaine, aka Mixed Girl Maine, the busiest mixed race bisexual polyamorous atheist comic book nerd cat mom podcaster in this podcasting game this is episode 97 and it would have been an episode that would have been entirely focused on juneteenth the celebration of emancipation also known as black independence day known as cell liberation uh it's got so many different names and if you've been with me for the whole time you know that i launched the original promo for militantly mix on juneteenth 2018 because it was it's always been such a day of significance for for me and my family but this was also in in a in a matter of speaking a symbolic gesture about the emancipation of the fear that I had in putting my voice out there with Militantly Mix. And I wanted to announce to the world that Militantly Mix was coming on Juneteenth because that felt really significant to me back in 2018. And then last year, I did a Juneteenth episode in which I talked to other folks, other podcasters that I had connections to that were willing to come on and share their Juneteenth stories with me. I wanted to talk about how we celebrate last year. This year, with everything going on, I think I I probably would have focused more on or and still want to focus more on how far we should be (laughs) since since Juneteenth. But so much happened over the last week. There was all this other stuff I wanted to talk about. There was one topic in particular that I wanted to address. And now that. Yeah, I don't know, like I kind of don't know where to begin. So just rewind a little bit to last week. When I released last week's episode, I released it a day late because with life being what it is right now, it's it's been really hard to kind of get things out on time. I've also seemed to have an increased workload right now, which I can't tell if it's increased because I'm moving slower or if it's increased because of the nature of what's going on in the world. But it's just been overwhelming in terms of expectations and things that I have to do while also trying to keep up my activism, while also trying to give myself breaks here and there because as I talked about last week, rest is an important aspect of activism. And uh, I hope I'm staying afloat. I, But as of right now, as much as I really wanted to go back last week after I released the episode, I really wanted to switch gears back to the regular Militantly Mix episodes for this week. Still addressing what's going on in the world, but um, you know, I know that y'all are here usually because Militantly Mix is about mixed race narratives and I want to be able to get back into sharing those narratives, but I'm still stuck in that place that I was stuck in over the last couple of weeks where it's it's really hard for me to f- pull up one of those interviews and edit and focus and pay attention so that I can give the episode the credit that it requires, the, the attention that it requires. Do I think it's impossible right now? No. Am I struggling with it? And does it take longer, which I don't have extra time for? Yes, that's pretty much what's going on. So last week after I dropped the episode, I wanted to drop one of the recorded interviews this week. And I pulled one up to start working on and I just couldn't finish because it was murder after murder quote unquote assumed suicide stories, really horrifying deaths of people last week. And it's been happening. Of course, that's what we're fighting for. That's why that's why everybody's taken to the streets. But some of the reportings of this last week of the 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 nature of how some of these people were murdered really just it put the brakes on being able to to focus to um to release those other episodes. And I'm I am really apologetic to my audience, especially the regulars, the people who've been with me for a while because I I know that you're here because of those narratives. We've had kind of a really strange growth in the show over the last 
two weeks, specifically the last two weeks since June 1st. I don't normally really pay that close of attention to the numbers. I do pay attention to the numbers because that's an important aspect of learning how to process the growth and and how to grow so that eventually the show can become eligible for sponsorship and things like that that'll help increase the the quality of the production. Um, you know, eventually I do need to make an income doing this show because it does take so much time. And as we grow, it ends up taking more time and, and more resources. So uh, we do need to get to that that place. We're just not there yet. So I do t- pay attention to the numbers loosely, but over the last 13 days, the show has grown by three times the amount of normal listeners. And that actually kind of freaked me out. I mean, if it wasn't COVID, if it wasn't uh, the current uprisings and Black Lives Matter movement, I would just be like, oh my gosh, we're almost there. We finally cracked it and, and we're going to start growing. We're going to be able to, to um, start making generating income with the show. But because of what's going on right now, what's worrying me is the motivation be t- behind the extra downloads that I've been receiving. So I dug into the numbers a little bit further. I, I paid a little bit closer attention to the analysis of the things and uh, two things that could have potentially been happening when I saw those numbers, uh, when I saw the graph first that showed the big peak. Uh, one thing could be that people, mixed race people are finally showing the, seeing the show. They're, they're hearing about it on Reddit or on the mixed race groups on Facebook or something like that, or a friend is sharing. And, and now all of you are sharing with multiple friends or something like that. Maybe that's what's been happening. That would be great if that's what's happening. Uh, the other thing that could have could be happening is that monoracial people have find the, found the show. And because I've been recording solo episodes about my, my activism and a black, about the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, maybe they're using this as a tool for learning and, you know, learning how to do work towards anti-racism. I think both of those things could be happening, but I was really worried that it was mostly the latter because obviously those will go away eventually once people kind of move this out of the news cycle. It's already starting to fade from the news cycle, even though protests are still actively happening. The news is just starting to not report on it. So I, I was I was a bit nervous. Then I looked at the actual what episodes were being downloaded and where they're being downloaded from. And it does appear that while my most recent solo episodes are generating um, a lot higher numbers that I normally get on a weekly download, it looks like every episode of Militantly Mix has been downloaded between two and six times a piece every day for the last 13 days. Um, I guess I'm excited about this growth. I hope this growth continues because it will make a difference in the production of this show. But I want to check in with y'all because I want to I want to see who's following the show and I want to see why people are following the show. So I kind of have a two part action. I have an action call. I have a call to action, but it's divided up over two ways. So I'm going to talk directly to the two different groups that I think are listening to the show for my regular folks, for the folks who have been with me for for a long time. I want to check in with you because I want to see if the show is actually being satisfying right now. I know there's so much going on and, and maybe having regular episodes like you're used to would be a comfort. And despite the fact that I'm struggling to do that, you know, maybe I maybe hearing that that's what you need will be that extra push to get me to get me there. Because I want to do right by by my audience, uh, the people who have been, you know, with me and supporting the show for for a while. So I want to check in to see how you're doing and if the show is giving you what you're here for normally. And maybe maybe the maybe the thing is that I need to split these episodes and actually release their normal episodes and also throw in some activism episodes. Maybe that needs to happen or maybe you know, which would increase the amount of time I have to put into production, which may not be possible, but maybe that is something I need to do. So I just want to hear from y'all and see if that's if that's what you what you need. The second call to action, I guess, is is to the new folks who have just joined us. Um, And the question I want to ask you is, why are you here? Are you here because uh, you are mixed race and you're finally found a place that you can get mixed race narratives and then you join the show and it's all about Black Lives Matter <laughs> activism? Or are you digging into the crates and, and listening to those mixed race narratives and finding yourself being reflected back at yourself? You know, are you getting what you need as a mixed race person listening to this show? Or are you a person who is attempting allyship and growth towards anti-racism and uh, and the solo episodes were, were how you got here? If that's how you got here, are you listening back to the previous episodes where you're where they are about individual mixed race people sharing their stories? So those are the two questions that I have for the for the different groups that I think are listening, you know, my regulars and and the new folks. 
what I like to do is hear from you directly. The most ideal way is to hear from you via your own voice. So you can either record a voice memo and email it to me or leave a voicemail on my Skype line, which is 323-545-6001. I record a couple minutes of, of a message just to let me know what it is you are getting from the show. If you need something, if something's missing from what it used to be, just check in. I just want to hear from y'all what the show is is providing for you right now. For my new folks, same thing, voice message or a voice memo that you can email that just to check in and let me know why you're here and what you're learning, if, if, that's, if that's the part that you're here for and what your action will be after this falls out of the news cycle. What's your next step? If you're here to learn about people that are different from you and, you know, talk about, you know, hear conversations about anti-racism and things like that, what is your action item after this falls out of the news cycle? Get at me. Let me know what's going on. You can also email me at Charmaine at MilitantlyMixed.com. That's S as in Sam, H-A-R, M as in Mary, A, N as in Nancy, E at MilitantlyMixed.com. Or you can always slide into the DMs on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at MilitantlyMixed. They're all open. We also have the social groups on Facebook, both the open page and the private group. The private group is more focused on mixed race listeners because it is a safe space for us to to commune with our tribe. Um, So if you're a listener of the show, but you're not mixed race and if you do join the private group, I just wanted to be clear that that space is designed as a place that we can talk about what our life experiences are in a safe space where we're not going to be attacked for our experiences or our feelings or someone to say, well, I've never seen that before. Can you tell me more? It's not meant to be an educational space for non-mixed people. It's supposed to be a safe space, a therapeutic and helpful, resourceful space for mixed people. Okay. That's the, that's the first part. Uh, I am really excited about the growth and I, I hope it continues. I just want to make sure that if it's based off of these solo episodes, when those solo episodes go away, are y'all still going to be here <laughs> um, or not? Because that would, that would be very interesting to know because maybe that means I need to start another show or something like that. I don't know. All of this has to do with whenever I finally get funding to be able to produce the shows at the level that I want to produce them. Okay, so let's move on from, from there. What I really wanted to talk about this week, I would have focused mostly on Juneteenth this week, but I think it's important to keep up these con- this discussions about what's going on in the world. And to be honest, if I'm not doing, if I'm not able to produce the episodes with the, with the interviews, the, the mixed race narratives, I would prefer that it wasn't just my voice out here on these episodes talking about the current uprisings and the protests, but I, I have not been able to, like I'm at max capacity with my, with my full-time job, my part-time job, the producing of the podcast and the activism. Um, I don't know when I can actually schedule recordings now. I don't know how I'm going to be able to do that. Although I I would like to try to do that. Pretty much have one day a week, one night a week. That's not currently um, a, a recording day or an editing day or a day at my other job. It's pretty much just one night a week after work that I have. And maybe that's the day that I start doing the recording. I don't know. I still have to also figure out a time to schedule rest. Because as I said last week, rest is an important side of activism and I can't keep telling people to do that and then not doing it myself. But I think because so much is going on in the world, I can't focus entirely on Juneteenth. So what I'd like to do is talk about this concept that has been kind of rolling around in my head for the last week or so, share it with y'all, put some resources up about it, and then cap the show with a little bit of talking about Juneteenth because it is a very significant day for me and I think for the show as well, given that I released my first promo on Juneteenth a couple years ago. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about this week is this concept called DARVO, which is Written by um, a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon, Dr. Jennifer J., and I believe her name is pronounced Freyed or Freud, possibly. It's spelled F as in Frank, R-E-Y-D as in dog. Um, I've never seen this name written down before, so I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I think it's important to make the attempt to pronounce the names correctly. So if anybody knows how to pronounce that, send me a voicemail so I can hear it. Okay, so I'm actually just going to read the opening section of this uh, article that she had written, this paper that she had written about this, because uh, while it is going to talk mostly about sexual offenders, I it is something that is actually happening in this discussion about Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, general lack of empathy towards um, other people. So it all makes sense once once we get into it. So uh, I'm quoting here from, from her paper. Darvo. 
Darvo. Darvo refers to a reaction perpetrators of wrongdoing, particularly sexual offenders, may display in response to being held accountable for their behavior. Darvo stands for deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. The perpetrator or offender may deny the behavior, attack the individual doing the confronting, and reverse the roles of the victim and offender such that the perpetrator assumes the victim role and turns the true victim or the whistleblower into an alleged offender. This occurs, for instance, when an, an actually guilty perpetrator assumes the role of falsely accused and attacks the accuser's credibility and blames the accuser for being the perpetrator of a false accusation. Institutional DARVO occurs when the DARVO is committed by an institution, parentheses, or with an institutional complicity, close parenthesis, as when police charge rape victims with lying, institutional DARVO is pernicious form of institutional betrayal. So I wanted to read those two sections because I think that this this is actively at play right, right now during the current protests and the risings in relation to the Blue Lives Matter and the All Lives Matter uh, voices that are trying to deny what the actual purpose of the Black Lives Matter movement is. So again, just to repeat what DARVO stands for, it is an acronym that stands for deny, attack, and reverse victim and offender. And this is happening all over the place. To start, I'll give you the easy example from last week. When the 75-year-old white man went to go talk to a police officer in Buffalo last week during the protest, and he was knocked down, splitting his head on the pavement, and then 20 or so cops walked over his body without tending to his care. He's lying in the hospital in an ICU. His head split open. He's got brain damage. And we see asterisk 45 tweet that maybe he's an agitator for Antifa. This is the actual victim, the person who was pushed over by a police whose head was split, who is in the hospital bleeding and dealing with brain damage, is being accused of being uh, an agitator for Antifa and basically being accused of causing the problem that ended up in his injury versus pushing the blame exactly on who it was for the police officers that pushed him down and the other police officers that walked over his body without taking care of him. So I keep seeing the thing about the, you know, some bad apples with the police, but there's other good apples. But in that image, all I see is 25 to 30 bad apples because no police went to his aid, even though the police are there to protect and serve, not to cause harm, supposedly. So while it's a little bit different because they're, they're, it's not the actual perpetrator and the actual victim, we're, we're dealing with the institutional side about it. The idea that the police were somehow victims of this 75-year-old man who was supposedly an agitator. That's one example. You're seeing other things, too, of like, you know, if, if they're really trying to protest for Black Lives Matter, why are they destroying their own neighborhoods? Why are they destroying their own property? You know, the cops are there to help them, but they're the reason why things get out of control. You see a bunch of these types of Darvo type of situations. And another one that's really pervasive, that is really actually a source of anger for me personally, is this idea of the white ally who is not getting the benefit of doubt or they're not being praised for their efforts. And so they turn it into this thing. So let's say an example I talk about I, on Blurred Comics this week, which is an event that happened at my job last week. My coworkers as a whole, we were all in a meeting of the entire, the entire school. Uh, somebody suggested that everybody kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds in honor of George Floyd. And I talk about it in more detail on Blurred Comics this week, so I'll just kind of summarize it here in case you listen to both shows. But essentially, a black woman told the told the school in the in the chat function, "Let's you know, can we do a kneel for eight forty six uh, for George Floyd?" And there were so many white coworkers that it were too like almost happily enthusiastic to participate. Yes, yes, please! Extra exclamation marks, smiley faces as they got down because we're on a video chat as they got down to to kneel. And then some people stayed on their phones. Uh, some people were like smiling at this effort that they, this opportunity that they were given to acknowledge the death of George Floyd. And it really bothered me. The symbolic gesture bothered me because one, a black woman had to, had to suggest it anyway, not tell them to do it. And two, instead of acknowledging how grim this was, 
they were like enthusiastically happy to have an opportunity to do this little symbolic gesture um, that would make them feel good about themselves. And they probably posted about it on on t- Facebook or Twitter that night. And I was so annoyed about it. I, I was kind of going off about it later um, to other people or whatever. And I heard, you know, kind of like, oh, you got to give people the benefit of the doubt. They're trying. They don't know what they're doing. You know, they don't know what to do. But this is 2020 and we've been dealing with systemic racism forever. There have been black lives being murdered by the police forever. We have video footage for a really long time. So to say like people are trying and to give them a break, we don't have time to give people a break. And this is how I feel. I don't feel that we have time to give people a break. And for somebody who says I'm trying or they're trying really hard, give them a break. I feel that this is a version of Darvo, this idea of deny that there's an actual problem, attack the person who brings up discontent with the situation, and then reverse the victim in the blend. These poor white people are just now learning that racism exists and they're, and they're really trying. And here you are being so mean to them. Why should they support Black Lives Matter or be anti-racist if you're just going to treat them like this? I feel like this is really pervasive right now. I'm seeing it all over. And and I cultivate my social media so that I mostly see things that I want to see <laughs> or people who I fall in line with. I, I do think I should broaden it out a little bit more so I can see basically what the other side is seeing so I know what to combat. But it's too hard for me to see that stuff right now. And yet lately, it's been slipping into my view where even people I know are saying, you know, cut people some slack. They're trying. Maybe it's fair that some people are trying. But why you needed all these videos, all these murders, why you need all these books, all these reference materials that have told you that this has been a problem, that you have seen it, whether you believe you've seen it or not, you've absolutely seen it. And in some cases, you've been the perpetrator. For you to only be coming to it now because it's so heated of a time, I I can't give you a pass for that. I can't give anybody that slack because people are dying. Even just last week, between the time that I released last week's episodes and the time that I recorded this week's episode, Robert Fuller, Rashard Brooks, Dominique Remy is her nickname, Fells, Dominique Fells, was dismembered and shoved into a suitcase. I mean, I don't I don't know how many other names there are there. I, I'm picturing photos right now and I can't even think of their names. And I know that there's this whole thing about Robert Fuller being a suicide, but I'm not going to buy that a black man hung himself but on a tree outside of City Hall, especially since there was another hanging of a black man a couple weeks prior, relatively close to where this incident happened. So, and then this morning, the day I'm recording is Monday this morning, a uh, Toyin, a Black Lives Matter activist in Tallahassee who was 19 years old, who was sexually assaulted by a man who claimed to be from a church and was going to help her have a place to stay for the night, sexually assaulted her, and then today she ends up being found murdered. Uh, she'd been missing for a few days, and then she ended up being found murdered. So I don't have time, as far as I'm concerned, to give people the room they need to grow in their allyship. And I don't think, well, I do think it's important that you expose yourself to materials and you're reading and you're watching videos and you're listening to documentaries and you're listening to people talk. I think all that is important stuff to do. And I'm not telling you to stop doing this. What I'm saying is that if you needed to read a book to understand what was going on in the system or to finally acknowledge that systemic racism exists, I don't have, I don't have that time. Um, so I bring up Darvo because I wanted to raise awareness about it so that people can kind of keep an eye out for when it happens so they can combat it when it happens. Call out somebody who is pulling Darvo on you (laughs) or pulling Darvo on somebody else in relation to this movement. You can't let people get away with it because if they get away with it, it'll go back to status quo. We are, like I said last week, all hands on deck. This cannot stop. It it has to keep going until they're so exhausted they give in. (laughs) Honestly, Um, it's kind of like these symbolic gestures that are happening right now. They're also kind of not doing anything for me right now. The Black Lives Matter lettering being printed on streets, painted on streets. Well, the concept and the ideas is lovely. Where's the action that follows that? What's next? After you painted these letters on the street, what's actually going to happen to prevent more murders of black people? The most insidious one so far is Flint, Michigan painting the Black Lives Matter letters on the street. If 
Black lives really matter in Flint, Michigan. Why have you not fixed the water system yet? Water, and I tweeted about this earlier, water literally equals life. You cannot survive without water. And people have been being poisoned in Flint and dying and having lifelong illnesses now as a result of the problem of water in Flint. And you're going to paint Black Lives Matter on the street, but not repair the pipes so that people can actually have drinkable water, that they don't have to drink water exclusively from water bottles that are shipped to them from other places. We're watching Little Miss Flint grow up on activism. Since she was a little baby, she was doing fundraisers for water for Flint. And now she's damn near a teenager. Uh, she's preteen at least. And we're watching her grow up in her activism. And that is unacceptable. So another way that Darvo is being applied is when these symbolic gestures go up and someone says, okay, you painted the letters on the street. What's next? What are you doing to change policy? What are you doing to stop police from killing black people? What are you doing from stopping organizations from not hiring black people, uh, from gentrification? What are you doing to stop any of these things? Well, I've painted the letters. What more do you want from me? Uh, give me time. I'm learning. To me, that sounds ridiculous. So... I wanted to point that out because I, I, I want to kind of raise awareness. It wasn't a concept I understood, I like heard anything about until recently. It was shared with me. So I'm going to share it with you. Uh, I will put a link in the show notes to the to the paper that was written by uh, Dr. Jennifer Freud, Freud, Freud from the University of Oregon. I'm going to share that that paper in the show notes so that you have access to that information. And there's a few videos online that do kind of explain it and how it applies to this current movement as well. Uh, it's just one of those things that I think might be helpful in this fight to to look after our, ourselves. Last year, I did an episode on Juneteenth where I wanted to focus more on what we do to celebrate, how we celebrate Juneteenth. In 2018, I launched the first promo of Militantly Make, um, partially because it, it felt like it was marking my own emancipation from the fear of expressing myself to being to my, my fear of being a voice in this. It was the break between me being apologetically mixed and unapologetically mixed. And I wanted to let the, everybody know that the show was coming. And what better way to do that than to release a promo on Juneteenth? In 2019, I released an episode about how we celebrate Juneteenth. I, I did a little bit of an explanatory history about it. So if you do want to hear more about um, the origin of Juneteenth, I just recommend going back to that episode rather than me rehashing what I what I put out last year. That was also episode 50. It was a milestone episode in terms of the number and a milestone episode in terms of the significance of Juneteenth. Today, I guess I want to focus more on I, I guess I want to I want to talk a little bit about what's happening in relation to Juneteenth. So if you have heard the previous episode, I grew up celebrating Juneteenth and I didn't realize that all black families didn't celebrate it. And what I had since discovered as an adult, the reason why my family celebrated it is because we have our origins in Texas, most likely in Galveston, as one of those families that heard about the Emancipation Proclamation two and a half years after it was released. So as my family migrated from Texas to California, they kept up that tradition. And that is how I was raised knowing about Juneteenth and celebrating it throughout my childhood. As an adult, I moved from California, where I've celebrated Juneteenth my whole life, to Texas, where the origin of the celebration comes from. So there were parades, there were, there were bigger celebrations than I had experienced before because my family always uh, celebrated it together. So I didn't even realize other black families weren't celebrating it too in California. Then I moved to Boston and that's when I discovered that not all black people knew about Juneteenth. I didn't know it wasn't nationally known. And I was searching for Juneteenth events in Boston while I lived there, and I didn't find anything while I lived there. And then I came back to California, and I instantly started looking again. And the very first Juneteenth thing that I saw close to where I lived was in Santa Monica. So it was a predominantly white space and a predominantly white celebration with a handful of black families and or mixed families and um, some black businesses. And that was it. It wasn't, it wasn't a very satisfying event because it didn't feel natural. 
And then last year, I got an opportunity to go to the Juneteenth Heritage Festival in in Lamert Park. And that was when it got real again. That's when it was in predominantly Black people, predominantly Black businesses, music and performances, and in a very Black community. So it, it was real. It felt real. And I also ran into someone that I know out there, and it was it was just a really good day. It was a real recharge batteries day, like recharge my Black battery day, I guess. It was closer to what I remember experiencing as a kid than I had ever experienced before. And this year, the plan was to have a booth there for Main Hustle Media. So Black Radical Queer, Militantly Mix, and Blurred Comics we're all going to be there together. And then COVID hit. So we already knew we weren't going to be able to have a Juneteenth booth at the Heritage Festival this year. And knowing that COVID was still going around and knowing that COVID is also the reason why I haven't, was one of the reasons why I haven't been attending the protest directly because my health and the fact that COVID is, is out there, it wouldn't be safe for me to do that. So I was trying to figure out how am I going to acknowledge Juneteenth this year? How am I going to... How am I going to honor the day? And until today, I didn't really have an option. I didn't really have a solution to to that issue. And then I started noticing that a lot of major corporations such as Nike, I guess to an extent NFL, and a couple other smaller companies as well are also starting to acknowledge Juneteenth as a paid holiday. And the idea of Juneteenth as a paid holiday, I feel... I feel mixed feelings about it. I definitely would like of all days Juneteenth to be a nationally recognized holiday. I think it is more reflective of American independence than 1776 July 4th. I feel like this is one of those gestures too, like it's it's affecting some kind of change, but is it going to have permanency? Is it going, is it, is it riding the wave of, of these sort of publicity stunts and things like that? Are we going to turn this holiday into oh, f- away from being a, a very black celebration to a very, you know, three day weekend focused celebration like they do with Veterans Day and Memorial Day and stuff like that without actually honoring the actual reason why the day exists? It becomes more of a play day for, for people who want a day off of work. That's what I'm worried about. That being said, I still want that day available to me. So what I decided to do this year, and I don't have an answer for it yet, is I, even though I am a temp at the place I work, I wrote a letter to my boss requesting the day off as a paid holiday, which is a pretty bold move, I think, for a temp to request that. I requested it on, on behalf of myself and the school at large, but my I don't have an answer yet because I today was a big meeting day and I didn't even get to see my boss until the end of the day. So I know that they're probably dealing with it tonight or they'll talk to me about it tomorrow. I've, I've usually taken a day off like use my own vacation time for it if I had it. I don't have it right now since I'm a temp. But regardless of whether I get the paid holiday or not, I think the important way for me to honor Juneteenth this year, given COVID, given the uprisings, is to actually shut off on Juneteenth. Acknowledge the significance of the day. You know, think on my ancestral background, think on what's going on in the world right now and and what more I can do to support the movement and to support my people. But I think in terms of my decree last week about how important rest is as a part of of activism, I don't know any other way right now that I could honor the day and keep true to what I've been talking about the last few weeks. So I think I'm going to celebrate the the day this this year internally. <laughs> that being said, Juneteenth is very much a day of music and food and family and and stuff and and to not have those. I mean even I talked about it last year on last week's uh, last year's episode. Uh, my connection to food is is altered quite a bit because I am a vegetarian now. And I have been eating meat here and there lately, but ultimately I don't want to eat meat because of loss of life for animals and because of the impact on the environment. Um, But I miss it and I I do want to celebrate the day with the foods that I grew up eating. So I have a conflict with that this year as I as I figure out how I'm going to maneuver that space. You know, and obviously the music, I could play music, but it won't be the same as as physically playing music with uh, friends and family and celebration and dancing and, you know, kind of stuff. But um That's how I'm actively going to honor the day this year. I'm going to shut all the way down for the day. And yeah, I think that I think that's the best way that I can handle it.
So what I want to encourage for those of you who may not be aware of Juneteenth, it did take place on June 19th, 1865, which is noted as the, the oldest and the first acknowledgement of emancipation. Two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed on January 1st, 1863, the news finally made its way to Galveston, Texas, and that was the last group of people that had not heard that slavery had been abolished. And they celebrated with dance and food and fellowship. The reason why it took so long for it to get to Galveston is twofold. One, there were still battles going on in the Civil War, even though officially, on the official record, it was technically over for the last two years. There were continuing battles going on, the, the last breaths of the Confederacy. The other reason is because people wanted another harvest, and so they kept the news to themselves because it was the burden of the slave owners to communicate that slavery had been abolished to those that they had enslaved, which, yeah, right. Of course they were keeping it a secret. The other thing is what was going to happen to people after they found out slavery was over. They couldn't just walk out off the plantation and get a house right away and and get a job right away and start their life. So it was a bunch of stuff that was going on during that time. But for whatever reason, it prolonged the announcement to those in Galveston, Texas, which to the best of history's knowledge was the last group of people to hear that slavery had been abolished. So if you don't know anything about this holiday, I can encourage you to Google it and do research about it. I encourage you to celebrate it over 4th of July. Uh, For me, 4th of July is my brother's birthday, so it was really never a big Independence Day for us anyway, although we did all the same things that every other family did for 4th of July. It just felt like it was for my brother, not for (laughs) America. So, um, So yeah. Share with me how you're celebrating Juneteenth this year. Hopefully you'll you'll post photos and, and hashtag if you are out there in the world or if you're just spending it with your family. I hope you're taking time to rest and to quiet your mind. I am not a person that can meditate easily, but I, I know there's a lot of you out there that do. So if you can find ways of meditation or if even just walking and and kind of thinking on what's going on during the day and stuff like that. Find different ways like that to take care of your health because we need stamina in this fight. We need to be able to continue to fight for as long as it takes to, to affect the, the major changes that we need to, to see happening. Um, while there are a lot of cities throughout the United States that are defunding or reducing funds to their police departments, it's, you know, it's early gestures. We still have a long, long way to go. So, so keep at it. Try to find support system wherever you can. Uh, right now, our social distancing virtual hangout is very much a, a place of of um, of support. Uh, it was suggested this week that it also be a place of activism as well. Uh, so, if you haven't joined us yet, you can join us through um, the social, the Facebook private group, uh, which is where I post the link for that. Um, I think for some reason now Zoom requires that you register anytime you participate, which I didn't set it that way, but that's what's happening. So if you would like to register for that, you can go to uh, the Facebook private group for Hotelly Mix and click to register there. Other than that, please don't forget that while there is uprisings and protests all over the country, all over the world, COVID is still a very real thing. We are still living through a global pandemic, so wear your masks, wash your hands, don't touch your face, social distance as best as you can. If you are out there protesting, make sure that you bring extra materials uh, with you, extra uh, tools with you to protect yourself from COVID while you're out there, hand sanitizer, guard, eye guards, and uh, wearing your mask and things like that to do your best to stay healthy. I do, I have learned today that someone that I know that was out at the protest has tested positive for COVID. So I know we're going to start hearing about that over the next week or so as the protests have been about 14 to 15 days at this point, which is about when symptoms start to show themselves. And remember that this virus disproportionately affects Black people. So we want to make sure that we keep you as healthy as possible because we can't have all of the global pandemics, systemic racism and COVID killing all of our people off. We need to we need to stick around to keep the fight going. Yep. Don't forget, we're still hosting. We're still partnering with the Bell Project for the uh, Legal Defense Fund. So you can go to the show notes and you can click on the Militantly Mixed Bell Project Legal Defense Fund. We are currently at a, a little bit above $1,400. We're trying to get to 2000 My goal is hopefully to surpass 2000 and keep going. Um, but for now, 
I will put that link in the show notes so that you can contribute. Please also share that link to your social circles. We really want to make sure that we're, you know, helping out our uh, cousins out there on the on the front lines if they if they need legal defense fund. There is also the mixed and hella black T-shirt, which is available on Teespring. That link will also be in the show notes. All the net profits for the purchases of those shirts go to Black Lives Matter. And actually anything that is purchased off of the Militantly Mixed Teespring store right now, the proceeds are going to go to uh, Black Lives Matter for the foreseeable future. We'll see. We'll see how long we can keep that going. If you are involved in any social groups, activism groups that you would like support from for Militantly Mixed, please send the information my way so I can I can vet it and then share it with the show and all of our social media handles. And yeah, I think that's it. Protect yourself. Please stay safe, everybody. And don't forget to be your mixed ass selves. Militantly Mix is a main hustle media podcast produced and hosted by me, Charmaine Johnson. Music is by David Bogan, The One. And if you like what you heard on Militantly Mix, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes and wherever you find your podcasts. Main Hustle Media. Turn your side hustle into your main hustle.